Welcome back everybody. Now recent events have got me thinking about the process of writing research papers and I do have some experience in that arena so I thought I would share my thoughts with you. Let's get started. So of course, full disclosure, I am a physicist by training. I have a PhD in condensed matter. I published several papers in that arena, two first author and three uh, co-author, second or third author on, on at least one of them. So I've done a fair amount of heavy lifting on two of the papers and acted as a kind of lab monkey as well as proofreader on the other three. Now I'm going to talk in the context of deep learning research papers because there really isn't a whole lot of difference aside from the content between writing physics papers and writing deep learning research papers, at least based on what I've read so far. So of course, another caveat here is that if you are a graduate student or undergraduate student in a research laboratory, then you should always follow the advice of your principal investigator. You can take what I have to say as something to think about, noodle on it, and perhaps think about how it fits into the philosophy of your lab with publishing papers, but you don't want to you know, cause any friction with your advisor, so always follow their lead on writing papers. Now all of that out of the way, let's talk about some of the most important aspects of the papers and they may surprise you. Uh, one of the most important aspects of the paper is the title. Yes, the title is in fact critically important and the reason is that the title is effectively marketing. The title is what people are going to read, the headline, and it will determine whether or not they want to read the rest of the paper. So the title must be something that is kind of catchy, it must speak to what the paper is about, and it must do so in a succinct way that draws the eye. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my research uh, as an undergraduate student, or sorry, as a graduate student, so that you can get an idea for how the process of crafting a good headline would work. So in two of the papers, we dealt with something called spin torque nano oscillators. This is a fancy term. Uh, it, it's actually a fancy technology. I don't want to downplay it, but the basic idea is that you have a layered multi-structure at the nanoscale, say 100 nanometers long by 50 nanometers wide, they're pillar shaped. You pass a current through one layer, that layer is magnetized, that causes a spin polarization. That uh, current, spin polarized current then goes through to a second layer that has a free roaming magnetization. And if you apply a magnetic field, uh, that will tend to orient that free magnet along that magnetic field. And when you pass the spin polarized electrons through, it causes the uh, magnetization of the free layer to wobble, to process around it, and in the process it releases microwaves. A microwave emitter is an oscillator, that's where the oscillator part comes in. Spin torque, tra uh, spin transfer torque is the name of the effect that causes the oscillation, so it's called a spin torque nano or nanoscale oscillator. Uh, what we observed were a number of interesting phenomena, so uh, you can also use a external waveguide, by which I mean like a 50 micron scale gold structure that you pattern on top of it to pump it with microwaves to attempt to synchronize that oscillator to those microwaves. Then by varying current and magnetic field, you can get different synchronization regimes. We observed a couple awesome phenomenon, uh, fractional synchronization, that was our most high profile paper published in physical review letters. And then there was also the concept of hysteretic synchronization, I'll talk about that in a second. But So the point about the headlines is that in the case of fractional synchronization, what we observed is that by applying microwaves at one frequency, we could observe responses at fractions of that frequency. So one half, three halves, as well as some, I believe, uh, other um, like seven, uh, seven eighths, eight ninths, something like that. Some weird, really weird types of fractions. I've, it's been 10 years, so I've forgotten a lot of this, but the idea was that we observed uh, synchronization at really odd regimes. And so we could have gone with a bland title like observation of off integer synchronization in spin torque nano oscillators driven by an external microwave magnetic field. We could have gone with something like that really long and wouldn't really draw the eye. So what we shortened it to is fractional synchronization of spin torque nano oscillators. Very short, very to the point. If you're looking through the archive for preprints and you see that title, you're going to say, ooh, that kind of sounds interesting. I wonder what that is. It'll get you at least to read more. Another phenomenon we observed was where when you sweep the direction of the applied uh, microwave field up and then down, you get locking of your oscillator. That's what synchronization is. It locks to the frequency. But what we observed was that you got a frequency locking over a different range if you went from low to high frequency of applied microwaves than if you went from high to low. So that's kind of a hysteretic effect. It depends upon the direction of the application of the external force, the history of the system. So we could have observed, we could have called that something like um, 
uh, directional dependent sweeping of f f uh, synchronization and spin torque national nano oscillators. But of course, we went with something more catchy like hysteretic synchronization of spin torque nano oscillators. Again, very short, very to the point, and something that caught people's eye that got them to read more. They're both relatively well cited papers in the field. Uh, so we did our job there insofar as the title is concerned. So with deep learning papers, it's much the same. And in fact, it's kind of even more important to craft a good title because the um, the field is significantly more saturated than the tiny field of spin torque physics in nanoscale devices in you know physics. It's a relatively small field, just a few dozen researchers, whereas deep learning is huge, you know, with thousands of people working on it. So the crafting of good titles of your manuscripts is incredibly important. Second thing you have to think about is the abstract. Now the abstract is the kind of an executive summary if you wrote any of those in school. The basic idea is you must summarize the results and give the person a reason to read the rest of the paper. You've already gotten their attention with the headline, they're already intrigued, so you want to make sure that you give them enough information to get them to read the rest of the paper. Remember, this is all uh, effectively copywriting in some sense, uh, at least the beginning portions of it. You're trying to sell the people that are observing the paper on whether or not it's a novel result, whether or not they want to spend their precious time reading it, right? Why should they read your paper over somebody else's? So you need to take care to write a good abstract as well as a good headline. So the next section is the introduction. So uh, we have to talk a little bit about academia here because it's important. So in academia, people will uh, publish papers in journals and it'll go to the peer review process. And who is it that is peer reviewing? The people who have already published in the field, right? Because you need someone who has experience in the field to be able to vet the information to make sure you're not, you know, making things up. Although this does fail, there is, you know, quite a few scandals with people making stuff up and getting away with it for an extended period of time. So it's an imperfect system, but that's the way it works. Uh, and the consequence of that is that in the introduction, you generally have to kind of play a guessing game of who is going to be reviewing your paper and you have to appropriately cite them. Because remember, everybody in academia has a vested interest in increasing their H index, which is kind of like a, a quantity that tells uh, the outside world how respected, how well cited they are. Uh, so you have to cite the appropriate people, otherwise they're going to take issue with your paper and they're going to find any reason to take you down. So you have to be very careful about citing the appropriate people. But as far as content, the introduction is specifically for kind of laying a historical framework in some sense. What has been done before? What have other people done? And why is your approach needed? And you want to word this very, very carefully. You don't want to attack other people uh, because A, that isn't going to win you any friends and you definitely need friends everywhere you go. And B, it's again going to give people a reason to take down your paper if you're submitting it to an actual journal publication. So you have to walk the fine line of selling your result without downplaying the previous work of others. You can say that things, you know, if someone else's result was lackluster, you can say it in a diplomatic and politically correct way that allows you to sell your result at the same time as paying pro appropriate homage to those that have come before you. Following the introduction, you will typically have background work. Now, this is where you'll stick technical details of how things uh, work, uh, not necessarily model details, but um, you'll talk a little bit about the mathematics behind your new approach, what the, uh, de any derivations if necessary, or you could stick those in an appendix, more on that later, but any real solid substantive theoretical or experimental information that is relevant to the paper. Uh, next, you'll typically have a section on methods. This may or may not be present. Some journals have different layouts than others. Uh, that's another point is that you want to write uh, in the style of the journal you're going to be submitting to. So if you're putting it on the on the archive, then I guess you would just choose a particular journal you like and kind of emulate that style. But the background is, uh, sorry, the method section is predominantly concerned with talking specifics about how your experiments were set up, how the simulations were set up, and uh, stuff that people can use to replicate the results. Which leads to the results section, which is typically where you'll have the bulk of the discussion. You'll talk about what you actually accomplished, why your result is new, why it's cool, and you should also have a rather a judicious use of plots here. So you don't want to go overboard with too many plots because people's eyes will glaze over. Uh, you want to use the right number of plots, the right type of plots to convey the most amount of information possible. Uh, since these papers almost exclusively go on the archive, you can make full use of color. You don't have to worry about paying for color in a print version. So make them as 
colorful as is appropriate. You may guess by my thumbnails, I'm not much of a graphic designer, uh, so I can't offer any specific insight there, but definitely look up sources on color schemes, for instance. You know, you don't want to have clashing colors. Uh, you want you want it to look pretty to the eye. Uh, if you're not, you know, so inclined with the graphic design skills, you definitely want to look that up to make sure you're not doing anything offensive to the eye of the reader. Uh, so the, the plot should convey what you are. They should kind of tell a story of what your result is and should really convey the most amount of information possible while maintaining or while taking up as little space as possible. Finally, you'll come to a section on uh, the conclusion, and that really just ties things together. That's not a huge, uh, hugely important section, uh, but if you have fruitful discussions with other collaborators that aren't listed as authors on the paper, that is the appropriate place to thank them as well as to disclose any financial funding. Uh, it's very important to disclose funding because people want to know what your financial interests are. So uh, that's, at least in physics, that's what we did. We would, you know, talk about who funded the research because that's important as well as to give credit to the funders, right? They, they need that. So uh, that is the basic structure. You have a headline, an abstract, an introduction, background, methodology, and results and conclusion. Very, very straightforward. Now you can also have appendices. So appendices is where you would put mathematical derivations if you have them as well as maybe a longer discussion of the algorithm that you're implementing. Uh, if the algorithm is short, you can stick it in the methodology section. If it is a little bit longer, then perhaps put some more detail in the appendix. And you'd also put things like hyperparameters in an appendix if you don't include them in the uh, methodology section. You want to include as much information as possible to help other people replicate your results. Uh, I've noticed with some of the DeepMind papers on Q-Learning, they leave out some important details about initialization of weights of layers. Uh, so they, you know, they give you enough information to kind of get started but not really replicate the results. And that's because they don't want you scooping the results and, you know, one-upping them because other everybody else is going to read the paper and be in competition to produce you know, better results. So you don't want to give them too much of a head start. You know, you give them enough information to start, but not enough to really overtake you. So other principles that I adhere to in writing a paper, and this may be somewhat contentious, uh, but I believe in the maximization of information density. And what this means in practical terms is that every single word you use, every preposition, every every pronoun, every everything should have a very specific purpose and function in the paper. No word should be taken for granted. And I mean literally no word within the paper should be taken for granted. That includes captions, that includes the text of the paper, that includes any text on the images that you may have. So the reason is that you don't want to have the appearance of fluff. You really want a paper to be something that people can really dig into and, and gain real understanding from. The point is to advance the state of knowledge of whatever field you're publishing in. And you don't do that with fluff. Uh, so some words to get rid of in order to, you know, get rid of that. That is a totally meaningless phrase. Uh, I hate seeing that anywhere when I, when I read that. I know the person isn't really editing their work carefully. Things like that, but don't really add any meaning. Just get rid of them entirely, cut them out, and write as tersely and as succinctly as you possibly can. Uh, now, that is, of course, a personal philosophy. Some labs may do it differently. They'll try to fill up as much space as possible. Perhaps they feel that taking up real estate is a symbol of, you know, the gravitas of the work. And if that's how your lab rolls, then do that. But, you know, if you're writing for yourself, then I would recommend being as terse, succinct, and as to the point as possible. So who should write papers? Should hobbyists write papers? That's an interesting question. I actually think you should. Now you won't be able to get it published on the archive, but I do think you should engage in the process of writing papers. And there is a pretty good reason for this. And the reason is that the, the thinking and writing are intimately related. If you can't write well, there's a strong probability you can't think well either because to write, you have to present a logical chain of, of you know, statements of cause and effect. You have to tell a story from start to finish and that requires a certain understanding of the topic, a certain ability to organize thoughts. And if you can't do that, it's okay. We, you know, in school, at least in the United States, we're taught to fill up pages with just word vomit, totally meaningless stuff. You know, you have to unlearn everything that's another point is if, you've educa if you're educated in the United States, as I am, you have to unlearn everything you were taught about writing papers before you attempt to write a scientific document because it's totally anathema to everything you need to do in a, in a, a journal article. So, so you should 
always be thinking about writing a paper about whatever it is you're working on. It doesn't even have to be original. If you're if you're just trying to reproduce somebody else's result, that's fine. You know, we've all got to start somewhere. And if you have an intention of contributing to research, uh, even though you may not have access to archive, you can solve that problem later. And it'll be much easier to solve that problem later if you can show a clear track record of writing good, clean documentation, good, clean records of what you did, results you achieved, and uh, in a clean and professional way. So writing papers is is a good idea. It's not something that's going to hurt you. You know, don't put it up on Vixera. That will hurt you. You can put it up on your own website. Uh, that's perfectly fine. You know, you don't claim that you've published a paper. You know, you can you can reference it and say, you know, I, I did this write up, call it a write up or something like that of, of some experiments you did or a project you worked on. And that would be perfectly acceptable to people, I would think. Oh, you may ask, and you may ask, what is the difference between a blog article and a sort of informal uh, journal article written by a hobbyist? That's a good question. And the the difference is that the blog article is written with the intention to educate, uh, to show someone who is not very familiar with the content how to do something new. A journal article is written with the intent of uh, uh, explaining to people who are already experts in the field how to do this new thing, you know, why this new result is important. So really the audience is what separates a blog article from a, an academic journal article. Always know your audience when you're writing. Who are you writing for? Obviously, if you're writing to kindergartners, you don't want to write anything too complex. That's an obvious case. And if you're writing a blog article, you want to write it from the perspective of teaching people who don't really know what they're doing. Whereas for an academic article, you want to write it for the purpose of educating people who already know what they're doing. One other thing on the, on the topic of content of a paper, if you take a look at, say, the a paper by the DeepMind group, uh, Human Level Play Through Reinforcement Learning, something like that, the original paper in Nature where they did deep cue learning, uh, you will notice the presence of many beautiful graphics. And that is kind of standard for the highest tier journals, say nature and science. You can debate about which is higher tier. I'm in the camp that science is higher tier, but whatever. I wouldn't gripe about being published neither, which I'm not, but you know, they're both really good. But the common thread is that you'll have very high tier graphics. And the reason is that you want to uh, you want to sell the result and you know we're visual creatures so having a pretty picture in there will really do justice to your work another reason it's important to consider doing pretty graphics for your papers even if you're not doing a submission to a high tier journal you want to consider the fact that if you're doing a new architecture it may be difficult for people to visualize and so having a clear clean beautiful graphic can really help to A, sell the result and B, help people read the paper and visualize what it is you are trying to do. So those are my thoughts on publishing papers and deep learning. Of course, with the caveat that I'm a physicist by training, not a computer science guy, not a, although I did have a little bit of computer science coursework, you know, I'm not strictly speaking a computer science person or a deep learning person. I'm just an enthusiast, a hobbyist, a physicist turned machine learning engineer is how I think of myself. Uh, and I think you'll find that if you read enough papers, most of what I've said is factually correct, uh, at least with respect to the layout of the papers and of course where I couch my specific philosophy on how to write papers. That's just my specific philosophy. Some people adhere to it, some people do not. Uh, that you can take or leave and certainly always defer to the standards and uh, practices of whatever research group you're working with. You don't want to go against the grain there and that will be a losing battle and you stand to gain nothing. So I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, make sure to smash that like button, hit the subscribe, hit the bell icon because I know only 14% of you get my notifications and I'll see you in the next video.